Pakistan's politics and prospects, next on International Focus. The Institute of World Affairs at UWM and Milwaukee Public Television present International Focus, a global magazine linking Wisconsin and the world. Welcome to International Focus. I'm Doug Savage from the Institute of World Affairs at UWM. Washington's relations with Islamabad are among the most challenging and complex in the diplomatic arena. Created as an explicitly Muslim state, Pakistan has sought to find a balance between its secular and Islamic identities. The rise of militant Islamist groups now controlling parts of this nuclear-armed nation have added to the turbulent political environment, prompting some analysts to call it the most dangerous country on earth. To help us identify the players in Pakistani society today and explore what may lie ahead, we're joined by Moeed Youssef, South Asia advisor at the United States Institute of Peace. His current research focuses on youth and democratic institutions in Pakistan and policy options to mitigate militancy in the country. Before joining USIP, he was a fellow at Boston University and Harvard's Kennedy School. He's also been affiliated with the Brookings Institution, and in 2007, he co-founded Strategic and Economic Policy Research, a private sector consultancy firm in Pakistan. Moeed Yusuf, welcome to International Focus. Well, I'd like to start, if we could, with uh, just some uh, background on the formation of Pakistan. I mean, this is a peculiar country uh, in a lot of ways. Apart from Israel, it's the only one which explicitly put religion as a condition for state formation. Uh, when British India partitioned into India and Pakistan, uh, Pakistan was supposed to be the homeland for uh, Muslims in India. And so there has been this tension right from the very beginning of whether this is just a homeland where Muslims and others would coexist, uh, or it's it's a homeland for people who want the Islamic laws to be implemented, in which case what happens to the minorities and the more liberal uh, elements in society. And I think that debate has never been completely resolved. There was a time initially, the first two or three decades in Pakistan, where I think they found a balance which was fairly moderate. Um, Islam was part of the state, and yet you had a lot of flexibility. Uh, the 80s onwards, I think the state uh, decided and deliberately uh, implemented policies which gave Pakistan much more of a conservative um, sort of element and, and it became much more of an Islamic state. Uh, still, I think there is, there is this debate. It's never been a totally Sharia-driven uh, state, but, uh, you know, it's, it's moved rightward uh, since the 1980s. And how has this conflict internally played out on the regional stage? Pakistan, if you look at the strategic paradigm of Pakistan, uh, with Islam, there was this hostility towards India, which marked the very sort of foundation of, of this country. The military has been the predominant institution. Um, you know, they fought three wars with India. Both are now nuclear powers. And so much of the security paradigm has been driven by this worry and threat from India. I mean, India, after all, was instrumental in uh, a war in 1971, which broke Pakistan into two. So, you know, those fears keep on coming back, even though time has elapsed. And, you know, the one single lens that has been applied uh, is India. So when you combine that with this conservative bent, I think it becomes much more amplified uh, in the Pakistani policy, the foreign policy, at least. So how much of a, a focus does that relationship really uh, create? I, mean, I'm, I think, for example, uh, when you're talking with, with Taiwan, whether you're talking about the price of grain or security policy, relations with the mainland is, is always the pivotal part of that conversation. Absolutely. I think even more so in this case, and more so because there is an active rivalry. Uh, and Pakistan has never really... Uh, given up the ambition of being uh, somebody who can stand up to India, unlike other South Asian nations. So I think there's been this continuous conflict, even if it is not armed, uh, in the mind at least, the two have not reconciled with the fact that these are two uh, strong enough nations who can stand up to each other uh, and coexist peacefully. And uh, also within the region, you've, the neighboring country of Afghanistan has figured prominently in the history. 
know, that's really what has upended Pakistan's security paradigm. Throughout history, the military has been very conscious of keeping its western border placid. When you have trouble on the east, that's all you can take care of was really the moniker. And 9-11 really, uh, you know, tore that apart. 9-11 had little to do with Pakistan internally, but the, the repercussions and sort of the, uh, what has happened in Afghanistan since then, the spillover, uh, has really upended this entire paradigm. And that's what you see the military trying to grapple with uh, even today. And they haven't been too successful at it. Well, and could you talk a little bit about uh, the role that Pakistan and and specifically the some of the elements within the security services played in the Soviet period in Afghanistan? You know, this is the irony. Uh, at the time of the Soviet invasion and occupation of Afghanistan in the, in the 80s, Pakistan and the U.S. were allied uh, on a principle which was to push back the, the Soviet uh, invasion. And there the, the ISI, which is the Pakistan Intelligence Outfit, and the CIA worked together throughout the decade uh, to make that happen. And quite interestingly, um, we in the U.S. and Pakistan used none other than the jihadi elements we are after today uh, to fight that off. And really, if you trace back 9-11, you'll find it in misplaced policies during the 1980s. So uh, we, we touched a little bit on the security services. Let, let's spend some time talking about other centers of power within Pakistani society. You know, there is this meta uh, sort of uh, figuratively, if you put it, it's the military versus the civilians. And, and the military has been the hegemonic institution for much of Pakistan's history, even when they have not been ruling directly. But then within the political sphere, you've got the right-wing religious parties, you've got the mainstream center, uh, right of center parties, then there's a sort of left of center party, a major one which is ruling right now, the Pakistan People's Party. Uh, and then you have on the fringes the, the regional parties, the ethnic parties. The interesting point to note here, and I think this is a misperception about Pakistan in, in the U.S., is that the religious parties never... Um, manage any substantial vote. Uh, and so while they may have street power and while you may see street protests coming out of them, uh, which are anti-US and perhaps, you know, very sort of radical in some ways, uh, they never manage to get any particular uh, clout among the voter. And Pakistan has always been ruled among the political parties by mainstream uh, left of center or right of center parties. Well, could you trace a little bit of that history since independence since the formation of the country and and the role of military versus civilian governments the military has had a schizophrenic existence when it has come to domestic policy they have used right-wing extremists uh, for their own uh, good both politically internally to keep the otherwise popular mainstream parties at bay and also militancy has been used as a tool against India in Indian Kashmir and then of course we talked about the Afghan Jihad in the 80s. Um, the interesting fact is that the military never wanted to radicalize Pakistan itself. They were using the right-wing uh, extremists or uh, the religious parties as a political or a tactical tool. Uh, nothing more than that. So they never wanted to sell this idea to the Pakistani public that the right-wing extremism is the way to go. Now, post 9-11, the situation has gotten out of control for them. Uh, and, and, you know, it's really come back to haunt them in, in a way where a number of groups which were under state's sanction and support are now basically turning against the Pakistani state. The politicians, quite frankly, I think they haven't been given the space to, to mature. Uh, but on top of that, they have exhibited tremendous amount of, um, uh, you know, self-serving kind of politics. There's a patronage association to that uh, politicking. And so they've been very unpopular as well, uh, which has strengthened the military's hand more than not um, in, in the Pakistani public opinion. And uh, what is the role of the military beyond traditional military sorts of uh, spheres. I mean, in, in many places, the military elite have insinuated themselves into the economy, for example. Is that the case in yes, Pakistan? Yes, in Pakistan, too, there is a political economy. But I think the military in Pakistan, much like the Turkish military, if I were to draw an analogy, is one that sees itself as the ultimate arbiter of national interest. And so whenever they see Pakistan weakening to a point where, you know, there's chaos on the streets, they will always step in and try and uh, reform the system or 
either ruled directly or from behind the scenes. Uh, so they have this image of, of the savior of the country, and it really comes out of the initial uh, creation of the state and the fact that it was the military uh, that uh, became the dominant institution uh, once India became the real threat to Pakistan post-partition. And that's really lingered on uh, to this day. And, and what about other elements within civil society? For example, uh, several years ago, we... we uh heard of the lawyers as a national bloc. Right. Can you talk a little bit about Pakistan, that? Pakistan uh, is uh, has a very vibrant civil society um, and you know even in the, the toughest of circumstances under military dictatorship in the 80s, uh, the, the lawyers, the journalists, the, the women uh, were never really kept under wraps. And, you know, if I were to characterize this, Pakistan is an extremely democratic polity caught up in a semi-democratic system. And so it's never long before dictators or incompetent politicians are challenged by the media, by the civil society, by blocks like the lawyers. The lawyers movement may have been a bit unique, but it's, uh, the country has got one of the freest medias in the developing world, uh, which, you know, it, their national pastime is criticism of the state. Uh, and so it's very unlike other uh, dictatorships. Uh, you know, Egypt is, is an example that comes to mind. Uh, it's very, very different than that. And we've got just a few minutes before our break, but uh, could you describe a little bit the process that led to the, the current government? The current government has um, come out of uh, the failure of military rule yet again, the, the third try at military rule. General Musharraf, who was the ruler, uh, ruled for about nine years. And, you know, Pakistan has this cyclical pattern. I've done quite a bit of research on this. But this government is just like the, the previous ones who came at the tail end of a dictatorship which failed and came through public support. Now, the interesting element is that in Pakistan, most of the military dictatorships have also not been resented by the public because of what I mentioned earlier, the incompetence by the civilian authorities. So one has to wait and see whether this one lasts, you know, and, and democracy is consolidated. But at this point, I think there is a consensus, uh, more or less, that democracy is the way to go forward. And uh, we've got just a, about a minute left. Uh, the current government is coalition, is it not? Yes, uh, it is a coalition. It's a weak coalition. Um, it's a discredited coalition. A uh, lot of allegations of corruption, of misgovernance. And quite frankly, that's nothing new to Pakistan. Uh, and, you know, this is almost history repeating itself. Um, the only change here is I think the politicians have now come together on a single point, which is they are not going to seek the military's help. Uh, to kick out their opponents. They are now fighting within the constitutional realm, uh, and Pakistan's future is about coalitional politics. And I think that's a positive step, that they are now, I think, decided that co the constitution is not going to be abrogated under any circumstances. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the future when we come back from a break. We'll be right back with more International Focus. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back to International Focus. We're talking about Pakistan's politics and prospects with Moeed Youssef, South Asia advisor at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Well, the uh, the current government faced somewhat of a crisis last January. If you could tell us a little bit about that. Well, the crisis came about because, as I said, it's a weak coalition. One of the major coalition partners uh, put up a demand of withdrawing some of the taxes that had been put. They also had a bit of a tussle on how they were running the provincial government, one of the provinces in Pakistan. And they decided to pull out of the coalition, which left the major coalition party, the PPP, uh, in a minority. And technically, uh, somebody 
could have one of the parties could have brought a no confidence motion uh, and basically ousted the government and had an in house change if not a mid term election um, of course you know uh, there was a lot of paranoia there was a lot of worry in the us in washington about what that meant uh, my sense is you know coalitional politics are always messy but as long as they remain within the realm of the constitution which this one was i don't see much of a worry of pakistan derailing the democratic process in fact if If there is a hyper sort of activity around that, and people are going in and trying to calm down uh, all factions, you may bandaid the problem, but it's going to come back again. Uh, it may be better to let the process evolve from within. Uh, otherwise, there's always this fear that the military uh, may be lurching in the background and and may you know uh, decide that things are going from bad to worse and may have to act on itself, and we don't want that. Well, one of the uh The results of that crisis was a pulling back from some of the economic reforms. Can you talk a little bit about the the current state of the Pakistani economy? You know, Doug, this is a very interesting uh, sort of time for Pakistan in some ways, where good politics may not be good economics. Uh, Pakistan's economy uh, was one of the fastest growing in, in, you know, from 2002 to 2006. Uh, and then, given the global recession, given some mistakes internally, it plummeted. And now it has an IMF package, which is really the lifeline. The U.S. assistance is going in, um, and so it's fragile. Um, but The problem here is how do you go in as a weak coalition and impose additional taxes at a time when the world is pulling away from taxes because of the recession so i think tough political decisions may be easy to uh, sort of communicate but if you're sitting in in the position of the ppp i don't see how you can go ahead and put all these taxes uh, and put more burden on your population especially when egypt has happened and um you know tunisia has happened and there's a worry that that may lead to other problems in pakistan as well uh, and so i think this is this is a contradiction in terms in in some ways which i don't see an easy solution to my sense is that pakistani politicians may have to make uh, populist decisions on the economy um, and while that may be bad macroeconomically that's just what good politics is at this point well you uh, you touched on us aid and i think for for many people in this country the level of aid would suggest perhaps we we have more uh, clout and more say in in what goes on in the country what what is your sense of of what the administration would like to see as the quid pro quo for that aid they would like to see uh, a lot uh, and actually that's part of the problem because we have seen aid as a tool to get more leverage on the terrorism front to get pakistan to do much more on helping us in afghanistan uh, you know to do much more on its internal militancy the fact of the matter is pakistanis never see any amount of aid as being able to change their strategic paradigm whatever they think is in their interest especially the military that's the line they're going to follow uh, the aid quite frankly i think should only be seen as a means to keep pakistan afloat and provide them the space to stabilize in the medium to long term but if we are expecting this aid to do something for us on terrorism it's counterproductive quite frankly because what this does is it reminds the pakistanis on just how transactional this relationship is and that's exactly what they've been complaining about for a better part of this decade now and uh you touched on the the internal militancy talk a little bit about uh, the the deal that was struck and uh later had to had to be revisited by the government there's a fundamental difference between what the us is doing in afghanistan and what pakistan has to do within its territory and that is that pakistan is fighting its own citizens and an a, a number of times they've been fighting citizens in populated cities so while in afghanistan the population is spread out we may have some more leverage some more leeway that's not the case for the pakistani military and the pakistani military because of its political uh, sort of face as well is very worried about its image within the country and so the swat deal that you talk about was really a deal to try and see if they could pacify the militants without having to launch an all out military operation as it turned out uh, it didn't work and thus they actually had to go in um, take out as many as 3 million um, of the residents 
put them in camps. They were really internally displaced people and then go after the military, uh, go about the military operation. They did succeed in trying, you know, in achieving what they wanted, but at a tremendous cost, you know, the, the largest ever internal displacement after Rwanda. And so you can't keep on doing that as a country which is already uh, under so much stress and which has a government which is very, very weak. Um, at this point, the Pakistani point of view is, we will take one group at a time and we cannot go after the entire spectrum of militancy uh, at once. And what we are hoping for is that they take on the Afghan groups before anybody else, um, because the Fatah sanctuaries is the real problem for us. Now, if you sit in Islamabad and start thinking, uh, what would you do first? Take down groups which are creating chaos within your own territory or do something which your ally is, uh, is hoping for. And I think they've basically decided that they're going to go after the anti-Pakistan groups before they do anything to, to the ones that are bothering us. Well, and, and in that front against militancy, one of, one of the issues that's ongoing is this notion of, of the drone strikes and, and the U.S. military incursion into Pakistani right. airspace. Talk right. a little bit about how that's perceived. It, there's a mixed feeling about that. Uh, you know, the I've, uh, people in the Fata region where the drones are being used are not as opposed to it because they've seen a lot of the quote-unquote bad guys be taken out. The rest of Pakistan, this issue of sovereignty, U.S. incursion, you know, the, the bully in the region is very much there. And, and so, you know, I, I myself am torn on which way to go. But the fact of the matter is the Pakistani um, authorities have authorized this in the past. It's not like the U.S. is doing it without any, um, you know, support from the Pakistanis. Um, the problem, of course, is this is the opacity of the relationship. You know, we never go out and tell the people on both sides what the dealings are. And quite frankly, that probably will be the ultimate uh, failure of this relationship because the people in Pakistan have already, to some extent, uh, taken over uh, the sentiment. Well, and... and if, as you suggest, perhaps the, the U.S. strategic interests are not well aligned with the political realities within Pakistan, what advice would you offer the administration as, as to a different approach? I think the first thing is to conceptually understand that we are now looking at suboptimal solutions. There's no perfect here. Um, two things that can be done where both sides should be on board, I think. One is a quick political reconciliation process in Afghanistan, which provides an answer which is acceptable uh, to all parties involved. And all parties, I mean Afghans first and foremost, then Pakistan, the U.S. and the regional uh, parties there as well. And the second one is really to continue a long-term partnership with Pakistan, which involves aid, which involves support to the military, despite the fact that they will not be able to do nearly as much as we're hoping they would for us. Uh, I think the, the problem here is that we can't only look at the short term. If we walk away from Pakistan, um, that's going to be detrimental not only to Pakistan, but also to U.S. interests in the long run. Well, and, and you know, rather than being a, a transactional sort of relationship, what are the long-term interests for both countries in a, in a more sustained partnership? I think... What ideally they should be and what the U.S. should be looking at is Pakistan as a major business partner. Pakistan is a country of 180 million where the U.S. can gain a lot of market access. Uh, Pakistan, a country that sits in a region which is going to be turbulent for a long time and thus you don't want to have adversarial relationships with any major party. Uh, Pakistan as the opening for the U.S. to much of the Islamic world because Pakistan still remains one of the most moderate Muslim countries. Unfortunately, at this point, everything that takes us to Pakistan is a worry about Pakistan, is a nuisance value question. You know, nuclear weapons, terrorism, uh, Pakistan-India, hostility. And until we transform that negativity into the positive elements that I've mentioned, it's very difficult to see how you'll continue beyond this Afghanistan question. Well, we've got just a few minutes left, but now uh, if, if you also have the opportunity to advise the uh, the Pakistani government, what what policy changes might you suggest there? Yeah, I've done quite a bit and it's a frustrating experience. But, you know, my singular message to the Pakistani authorities and Pakistanis always is that your problems have to be solved within Pakistan. 
nobody else is going to come and solve the, uh, you know there is a sense in pakistan that we'll be bailed out from outside because we do so much for the rest of the world and that just causes them to delay all the important decisions they have to make and you know if i were the pakistani uh, president or prime minister the singular message is all problems are our own and we need to solve them whether they were created by somebody else 30 years ago really is immaterial if you want to see a healthy prosperous pakistan you've got to make those decisions which are required well and uh, could you tell us a little bit before we go uh, about your work at usip in the south asia program USIP is uh, one of the major think tanks uh, in Washington and the Pakistan uh, program there what we try to do is of course a lot of research to improve the understanding of these two partners but there are a number of programmatic activities and it's one of the only think tanks uh, which has an active program on the ground in Pakistan which includes research seminars events um, a lot of training uh, conflict management conflict resolution type of activities uh, and i think i can safely say we do much more than uh, any of the other think tanks um, the idea really is to improve um, the understanding of the two sides and uh, to develop as many conflict resolution and management skills and capacity among the pakistani civil society uh, as possible and if our viewers like to access some of those resources absolutely it's usip.org and uh, you can go to you know the different countries that we cover and pakistan is very much there and much of this actually all of this including uh, videos and transcripts uh, sometimes of our events uh, are very much there and we do a number of seminars in washington as well as in pakistan uh, which which you know cover the a broad array of of issues within this relationship Well, Moeed Yusuf, thank you very much for joining us. Our viewers, we'll see you next time on International Focus. For information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220, or visit us at our website.